last week we started a new series, so this is a good time to get in on a new series. Look at 1 Peter titled, Life at its best. Now if you missed last week, we talked about life at its best being a life of praise and faithfulness and reflection and holiness. And if you ever miss a sermon, you can go back and on our webpage, you can always see what uh, the other sermons are and catch up in this series. But today I want to go over a passage of scripture that I intentionally skipped over last week. Actually, in the very first verse of 1 Peter, and if you need a Bible, you can always get one out of the pew there. Turn to page 208 is where you'll find our text today. But Peter, in that very opening statement, says this, To God's elect strangers in the world. So I've titled my sermon today, Life at its Best is a Strange Life. Now what in the world would I mean by that? Some of you just thought, oh good, this is finally a sermon I can relate to. They're talking about strangeness. Or you thought, he's talking about someone else, right? And you already picked out in your mind who that would be. Well, I want to start to just reflect a little bit on that phrase, uh, strangers. Why in the world would Peter use a word like that? Now we think of different things when we think of strangers or what it is to be a strange person. Even in early Christian history, there were people as we would look at them and we read about them, we would think, well, they're, they're kind of strange. There were these people called aesthetics. It's what really monks, you've heard of monks, how monks developed out of this group where monks would isolate themselves into a monastery somewhere and separate themselves from the world. Well, that began basically by men in the early church. They decided, if I want to be really spiritual, I must separate myself from the world, and I must deprive myself of some of the basic substances of life. One of the big things that many of the early aesthetics did was fasting. Some of them became quite famous. The first one that really kind of received notoriety in, in early Christian history was a guy by the name of Anthony. Anthony got to a point in his life where he felt that the best thing for him to do to become the closest to God that he could would be to move up into the mountains and totally isolate himself from the rest of the world. He did this for 19 years, from 286 to 305. He basically lived alone, and he felt that that was the best way to receive spiritual perfection. And we hear that, and they go, well, that's kind of strange. You're right. But another guy was even a little bit stranger, took it to the next level. This guy's name was Simon Stylite. Simon lived in northern Syria as a young boy. He felt that God had called him to be different and set himself aside. And, and he would do a lot of different things. One time he fasted for so long that they came in and found him almost dead. He had actually tied these bands around his waist so that he wouldn't get hungry. And they had to uh, soak his body for a couple days in order to get these bands that were so tight. So he just kind of did some strange things, but the one thing that he stands out for the most is he decided he wanted to live on a pillar. And on the top of that pillar, there was a platform, a little over a square yard. He lived on that pillar for 39 years. Bizarre. I want to show you a picture. They actually, if you go to Syria, I don't know if you'd see this today or not, because ISIS may have wiped this out by now, because they're, you know, they're, they're destroying all the Christian uh, relics. But this was actually the first pillar there on the left that Simon had, and they built a, a church around it, basically, and those are the ruins left. He was uh, in the, the mid-2nd century is when he did this. On the right is one that's much taller because they said by the end of the 39 years, the village people there, they would come out, they would give him the food and the watery things and that he needed to sustain life. And they kept building, building his pillar a little bit higher. Now, I don't know if he was excited about that or not, but uh, by, the end, by the end of the 39 years, his pillar was 15 feet off the ground. And that's where he lived for 39 years. And we hear that and we think, that's strange. So why in the world would Peter, in his writings, refer to the Christians, those he's writing to, you are strangers. And then in chapter 2, verse 11, we're going to get to later, he refers to them as aliens and strangers. 
The word is only used three times in the New Testament, twice here in Peter. The other times is Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, where it also talks about strangers. So what is this biblical concept that means to be set apart, a sojourner not belonging to someone, people around you? Why in the world is that applied to the Christians? That's what I want us to look at today. And I want us to think about this, a strange life. What is a strange life? I want to start by looking at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, and we're going to go on into chapter 2, and break down some of those things that we find there. And the first point is simply this, a strange life is a changed life. A strange life is a changed life. Now, Though in the back of your bulletin is an outline there of the whole sermon. And I'm just going to make it easy for you, to those who really like to fill in the blanks. I'm just putting them all up there at once rather than make you. Because I don't know about you, a couple of weeks ago we were up in Missouri. Went to a church that morning. They had the outline in the bulletin. And I'm the type of person, I sit there and I try to fill out the outline before the preacher actually gets there to see if I can guess what he's going to say. All right. So I don't, I'm going to take all of that temptation away from you today. There it is. You can fill in the blanks and then we can focus on, on what it says. But a strange life is a changed life. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the text. Starting in verse 22, it says this. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. You see, a changed life happens when we obey the truth. Now, how many of you know what it is to obey? All right? How many of you, you understand the word obey? All right? How many of you do it 100% of the time? All right, well, we got some work to do here this morning, and we're all in this together, all right? Obeying. It makes a big difference. And John, or Peter says here, well, you've become a Christian, and this is a continuation from last week's text. You've become a Christian, and now you are obeying the truth, and that has caused you to do something. And what it has caused you to do, it has caused you to love your brothers deeply and sincerely. Obey the truth. Jesus said in John chapter 13, we talked a lot about this in our, our series through the gospel, or, uh, first, or the epistle of 1 John. Jesus said, this is how they're going to know that you're my disciples. When you love one another. And Peter picks up on that theme, and he says here, look, when you obey the truth, it's going to cause something to happen, and it's going to cause you, and you have begun to love each other deeper. And it's so important in the Christian faith. It's so important in the church. We all know what it is to have surface relationships, don't we? Surface relationships are those that, you know, you say, Hi, how you doing? And they say, Oh, I'm doing great. And you go on. And those are okay, but a deeper relationship is when someone comes and says, Hi, how you're doing? And you can stop and say, You know what? I'm be honest with you, I'm really not doing very well. There's a difference. And Peter says, A strange life is a changed life. And a changed life comes when we begin obeying the truth. And that changes things. It causes us to long for fellowship. To want something deeper than the surface, hi, bye, how you doing? I think the Christians in the first century, they began to love each other deeper. deeper. Why? Because they began to feel that pressure, that persecution. And they realized if we're going to be strong, if we're going to stand firm, we're going to have to have a strong love for each other. And I don't think that it's far, uh, a far stretch to say we need that more in our world today. As Christians more and more are facing opposition around the world. And in America as that's beginning. We're going to have to stand up because of a deeper love. That has been brought because we've obeyed the truth. And people will begin to see that we are his disciples. When we love one another. So do something strange. Begin obeying the truth. Let that truth permeate your life. And let that enhance the relationships you have with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And then he goes on to say, once he's established that point, in verse 6, he makes uh, 
uh, this point. I'm, I'm sorry, verse 23. He says, For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. You're changed by being born again. That phrase has kind of become a Christian catchphrase in Christianity. You hear people all the time saying, Oh, I'm born again. I'm a born again Christian. I, you know, what does it mean to be born again? Well, interesting enough, that word was not, or that phrase was not a common phrase in the Bible, in the early church. In fact, there's only one other instance where you'll find that phrase being used in the Bible. It's in John chapter 3. There's this guy, Nicodemus. He's a religious leader, a Pharisee. And in the middle of the night, he sneaks around and he finds Jesus. Why is he sneaking? Because he probably doesn't want to see himself be caught by the other religious leaders of the day saying, how in the world could you go talk to this Jesus? But he comes to Jesus in the middle of the night and he says, Jesus, we know that you are an amazing teacher. And that you do things that could be done only if God was with you. Really, behind the statements of the question. And he's saying, Jesus, are you for real? Are, are you from God? And Jesus gives an interesting response to his statement. He says there, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And John gives the typical response that most of us would give if we heard that statement. What? What do you mean, born again? How is that possible? Is it possible for someone to go back into the mother's womb and be born again? And then you can almost see Jesus shaking his head and said, Look, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of the water and the Spirit. And it's that chapter and that conversation that leads up to that well-known, beloved verse of the Bible that almost everybody knows. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. You see, being born again, to be born again, means you come to the point of realizing who God is, and what He has done for you, and what that means to your life. Accepting Him. We're changed by being born again when that comes to be a part of who we are. I shared this on Wednesday night a couple weeks ago, but it's a great story. How they had, I had this young man came into my office in my, my other ministry, and he sat down and he had kind of come from a rough background, kind of had tattoos all over his arms, and uh, had come from a, a rough family situation. And I sat down with him and I said, Brian, I want you, to, I want you to read this verse. And he read John 3.16. And he read it and he said, Dude, that is awesome! It's like the first time he'd ever realized and he came to know the Lord and became a faithful follower still to today. How did that happen? Because he was changed by the power of the word. Listen to what Peter goes on to say. He says, For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. And the grass withers, and the flowers fall. What's Peter saying here? He said, none of us going to hang around forever. He said, uh, just like flowers look beautiful for a while, then they wither and they die. He's saying, this is encouraging for this morning, we're all going to wither and die someday. But he says, you know what? There's something that will never change. Verse 25 says, But the word of the Lord stands forever. And that is the word that was preached to you. Peter is reminding us, says, you remember that? When you came to an understanding of who God was and what He did for you and how you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, it said it's that word, that message, that is able to make all this change in your life. It's that which causes you to be able to love a deeper or more sincere love. It's that which causes you to be born again, to get a second chance, to start anew, to start afresh. 
And he said that all comes about because the power of the word of God. So a strange life is a changed life and it comes when we obey. It comes when we are born again and it comes when we understand the power of the word of God and how his words can change our life. But then he goes on to tell us how that all can happen. For you see, a strange life is also a spiritual life. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, I'm just going to read the first verse right now. In chapter 2, it says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. That word, therefore, is significant. It's a continuation of chapter 1. Most of you know, I think, that the scriptures were not written in book, book chapter, and verse formats. Those were added later. So this thought in chapter 2 is just a continuation of what's being said there in chapter 1. And he says, you know what? If you've realized these things, if your life has been changed by the power of the Word and the person of Jesus Christ, and you've been born again, he says, therefore, there's some things you need to do. And the first he says is, get rid of some things. Get rid of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander of every kind. Is there anything in that list that is kind of a good thing? Is there anything in that list that's just going to enhance your life if you decide to hang on to it? Envy, malice, slander, deceit, hypocrisies. Which one of those things do you want to have the most of? He says, get rid of them. He says, get rid of hypocrisy. That is probably the word that is... Uh, Best known maybe in the church, or maybe it's best known for those outside the church. There's someone that passed uh, this on on Facebook last week. Maybe you've seen it. I thought it was good. It says, not going to church because of hypocrites. It's like not going to the gym because of out-of-shape people. All right? You know, and I, I can come up with a lot of good reasons for not going to the gym. I'm tired. I ache. You know, I don't have time. Blah, 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 blah. But if I would just say, I'm not going to go because it's nothing but full of out-of-shape people. That's kind of crazy. We are here today because we are all out of shape people spiritually. And why do we come? To hopefully get back in shape just a little bit better. To find out what it is that we need to tone and we need to trim and we need to fit in our lives. And one of those things is Peter says, look, you, you need to get rid of some things. You need to get rid of some malice, envy, strife, all of those things. Those aren't good things. And how do you get rid of those things? This is what I love about Scripture. If you'll notice that almost every time there's a list of prohibitions or things that you're not supposed to do or things you're supposed to get rid of, almost every time it's followed by something that then you need to do to fill that void. And he does that here in this passage he says in verse 2, he says, Like newborn babes, crave pure spiritual milk, so that you may grow up into your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. We all understand what it is to crave. You ever had a craving? Oh, yeah, yeah. And it's usually we crave things that aren't good for us. You ever notice that? Peter's saying just the opposite. I want you to crave things that are good for you. I don't know if you ever saw the, the documentary called Super Size Me. It was about a guy that had decided to take on a McDonald's challenge. And he noticed that McDonald's there for a while, their campaign was Super Size Me. So he committed to, for 30 days, to eat all his meals at McDonald's, breakfast, lunch, and supper. And whenever they asked him, would you like to supersize that, he would say Yes. So they did all these physical checkups there at the beginning, and they did physical checkups at the end. And at the end of the 30 days, he wasn't the healthiest. But what's interesting, in the middle of that process, they interviewed him, and they said, well, are, are you getting tired of McDonald's? He says, no, actually, it's strange. I'm finding that I'm craving it more and more. Cravings are strange things. And Peter takes that negative concept and he says, hey, I want you to think about this in a positive way. I want you to crave this pure spiritual milk like a newborn baby. Now when a newborn baby gets hungry, what 
else matters in the world? Nothing. All that matters for that baby is that he or she get fed. He says, we need to crave the spiritual things. When was the last time you craved the Word of God? When was the last time you craved more quiet time or, or time to get away and reflect on God or read His Word? When was the last time you craved serving, doing something in the name of Jesus? Those are the types of things that we need to crave. Because it says there, this will help us grow up into our salvation. I like that phrase. Too many times, it's almost presented, well, what you need to do is to become a Christian, accept the Lord, be baptized, and then you're in. And don't worry about anything from there. That is just the beginning of the journey. We are to grow up in our salvation. When will you stop hopefully growing in your salvation? The day you die. And then you'll begin a whole new journey. A strange life is a spiritual life. And that spiritual life that means we need to get rid of some things and we need to crave some things. And then he gives an illustration of this is how you build. This is the foundation that's solid. That song we sang earlier referred to this. In verse 6, it says, For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. The cornerstone. It's an Old Testament Scripture. And in those days, it's a little more relevant than it is today because of the way we build buildings. But it's still built on the same principle. When a building is laid out, even today, they stake it out and they make sure that those lines are perfectly square. Back in the day when they built so many of the large uh, temples and all those things, the most crucial stone was what they would call the cornerstone. Once that cornerstone was set, all the walls would be built off of that cornerstone. And if the cornerstone was crooked or cockeyed or messed up, the whole building would be messed up. And Peter says it's that imagery, that cornerstone, that thing that sets your life at the right angle, that's what we need to trust in. And that is Jesus Christ through this prophecy. What would the world be like? Let's just, let's just say, even if not everyone became a Christian, it'd be great if everyone became a Christian and fully followed Jesus but let's just set that aside for a moment. And what would it be like simply if we weren't calling on people to become Christians, but that we simply called on them to live their life according to the, some of the basic, most basic things God has set forth. Let's, let's start easy. Let's just give ten things. The Ten Commandments. If everyone in the world began to align their life by the cornerstone established in the Ten Commandments, would that make a difference in this world? You bet. You bet. And Peter knows that a changed life is a spiritual life, and it only happens when we align ourselves with the Word of God, the truth of God, the cornerstone that is established for all of us. And then he ends this passage by building us up. A strange life, life at its best, is when we become royalty. Look there at the last few verses. Verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. How many of you have ever thought or said, boy, I'd, I'd like to be treated like royalty someday? You know, we, we like to imagine what that would be like to have someone do everything for us and wait on us and snap a finger and they'd be right there. A strange life is a royal life. How in the world can you say that? Well, Peter says, it's a life where you belong. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Belonging is important. We desire 
to belong, don't we? We desire to be a part of something. We want other people to have connections with us. What is the one thing that you hear almost 100% of the time when they're talking about someone that's become a serial killer or somebody that's something bombed somebody or something like that? Almost every time they'll interview people and they'll say, well, we knew he or she lived there, but they were kind of a loner. Never really interacted with anyone. You see, they didn't belong. And Peter says, you should never feel like that. You're a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. You belong to God. So the next time you're kind of down on yourself and says, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I think I'll eat some worms, have one of those days. Remember, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You belong to God. So much so that He sent His Son to die for you. A strange life is a royal life and God treats us like that. And it's a life where people see something different in us. Verse 10, He goes on to say this. Once you were not a people, and He's reminding them some things here. Once you were not a people, but now you're a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as, here comes the phrase, as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Aliens and strangers. And just to make sure we understand, when he uses the word aliens here, it's not little green people from Mars he's talking about. We think of aliens like that so many times. He says, you're aliens, you're strangers. He says, you're a group, you belong to God, you're in this world. But in another place it says, but don't be of this world. It's a call to set ourselves apart. To do something different, to be something different. To be a little strange. To go against the ways of the world. To go against what everybody says is the thing to do. To go against what everybody says, this is what you need to believe or not believe. or You just don't need to believe anything. Just so you feel good about it. That's all that matters. He says, no, you're a royal priesthood. But there's something different. It's because you have Christ in your life. And why do you do all this? So everybody can step back and look at you and say, wow, look at him or her. They are such a wonderful person. Listen to what he says. Verse 12. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good works and give you all the glory and build you up every day. That's what it says. No. That they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. Why do you do this? You know, technology has brought about a lot of different things in this world, and the cell phone is certainly one of those things that um, has changed a lot of different dynamics. And this, the phone with the cameras now, are just, you know, they dominate. Well, it's caused a new invention to be uh, created. It's called a selfie stick. Now, what a selfie stick is, if you don't have one already, you can go right out and get one, all right? It's a thing that you can attach your phone to, and then it's got a telescoping arm, and you extend that out, and you can hold that camera back, and little button here, and you can take a picture. Okay, of yourself. Now, I've thought about getting one for all the fish I take. That's the only way I can get them to fit in the viewfinder if I have to hold the camera way out there. You know. Well, maybe not. <laughs> but it's, it's an interesting dynamic that some people are so captured by taking selfies all the time, pictures of themselves, 
that they invented something to make it easier. And it's just a microcosm of a bigger issue that we have in our world that says, I am the most important thing. And everybody wants to see my selfie. No. And Peter says, look, I want you to do all these things. I want you to live this strange type of life so that in the end, people will glorify God. And I don't know if you caught that last phrase or not, but it's significant. On the day that he visits. You ever had one of those dock knocks at your door? You look out the window and it's someone, unexpected visitor. And you go... Ah, I wasn't expecting company. And you run back in the house and you start shoving things under a door, you know, throwing them in closets, you know, telling the kids, get in the backyard, you know, get away, you know. We got to make this place presentable in 20 seconds, you know. Why is that? Because you want to be presentable when an unexpected guest drops in. Peter just, just slightly reminds us. And you, you do all of this to glorify God, so you'll be ready on the day he visits. When is that day? No one knows. But he says, I want you to be ready. I want you to dare to live just a strange enough life that you will experience life at its best. And when that day comes, you'll be ready to really understand what life at its best really is. Let us live in such a way to bring Him glory so that we can spend eternity with Him. Let's pray.